Madame, on peut commencer Merci. All right, good afternoon. Um, Nikolai Mladenov, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, said today he is very concerned about the ongoing and serious escalation between Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Israel following the targeted killing of one of the group's leaders inside Gaza yesterday. He said that the indiscriminate launching of rockets and mortars against population centers is absolutely unacceptable and must stop immediately. There can be no justification for any attacks against civilians. The special coordinator said the continuing escalation is very dangerous and is yet another attempt to undermine the efforts to improve the dire socioeconomic conditions in Gaza and prevent another devastating conflict. The UN is working urgently to de-escalate the situation. Turning to Iraq, uh, Janine uh, hennis plashert the Secretary General Special Representative for Iraq, spoke to the Iraqi Council of Representatives, and she told parliamentarians that many Iraqis are asking for a brighter future for the country to reach its full potential and for the benefit of all Iraqi citizens. She added that the Iraqi people have paid an unthinkable price to get their voices heard. Since the start of the protest on the 1st of October, she said at least 319 people have been killed and around 15,000 injured. She reiterated the importance of guaranteeing the fundamental rights, above all the right to life, but also the rights to peaceful assembly and freedom of expression. Ms. hennis Plashert reminded the delegates that with full respect for Iraq's sovereignty, the UN assistance mission in Iraq has proposed a number of concrete steps as a way forward to confidence building and reform. She emphasized that now is the time to act, otherwise any momentum will be lost at a time when many, many Iraqis are demanding concrete results. Her full remarks are available. And the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon, Jan Kubish, uh, said today that he was disturbed by the tragic loss of life in Calde last night in Lebanon. He urged for thorough and rapid investigation in the incident. Mr. Kubish appreciated the stance taken by Wally Jumblat, who helped to calm down the situation while requesting justice. The special coordinator appeals to security forces to continue protecting peaceful protesters and refrain from using force. A uh, few humanitarian notes. Uh, from Nigeria, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that more than 100,000 people have reportedly been affected across seven areas in the country since late last month due to the worst flooding in seven years. Some 19,000 people have been displaced by the floods. The government is leading the response with the UN and its partners scaling up assistance to provide reproductive kits and farming supplies, among other aid. The flooding compounds an already dire humanitarian situation in Adamawa State, which is one of the worst affected by the 10-year conflict in northeast Nigeria. The 2019 Humanitarian Response Plan for Nigeria is calling for $848 million to help 6.2 million people, and it's so far only 59% funded. Meanwhile, the lean, less, lean season has begun in Southern Africa, with our humanitarian colleagues telling us that nearly 12 million people are severely food insecure. Parts of Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola are projected to face emergency levels of food insecurity, with acute malnutrition having risen in multiple countries. Many people are unable to access clean water, and girls and women are reportedly forced to resort to negative coping strategies, including early marriage and transactional sex. Southern Africa is experiencing the effects of the climate crisis, with warming about twice the global rate. Below average rains are being recorded in many areas in cyclones and are expected in others, which could lead to a second consecutive poor harvest. And in Bogota, the, in Colombia, the UN Refugee Agency, along with the International Organization for Migration, today will launch a $1.35 billion regional plan to respond to the increasing humanitarian needs of Venezuelan refugees and migrants in Latin America and the Caribbean and the communities hosting them. As early as this month, there were approximately 4.6 million refugees and migrants from Venezuela around the world. Nearly 80% of them are in Latin America and the Caribbean countries, with no prospect for returning in the short to medium term. If the current trends continue, 6.5 million Venezuelans could be outside the country by the end of 2020. The regional plan includes actions in nine key sectors, health, education, food security, integration, protection, 
nutrition, shelter, relief items, and humanitarian transport, as well as water, sanitation, and hygiene. In addition to the emergency response, the plan puts a strong focus on ensuring the social and economic inclusion of refugees and migrants. The plan is set to launch at 4 p.m. in Bogota. More information will be available online. And today, the World Health Organization announced the start of a pilot program to pre-qualify human insulin to increase treatment for diabetes in low- and middle-income countries. The decision announced ahead of World Diabetes Day, which is observed tomorrow, is part of a series of steps that WHO will take to address the growing diabetes burden in all regions. About 6.5 million uh, people with type 2 diabetes need insulin, but only half of them can access it, largely due to high prices. All people with type 1 diabetes need insulin to survive. WHO pre-qualification of insulin is expected to boost access by increasing the flow of quality-assured products on the international market, providing countries with greater choice and patients with lower prices. More information online. And finally, some uh, very good news from Mexico City. Uh, our Mexican friends have now uh, paid their regular budget dues uh, in full for 2019, bringing us to 135, but that will not unlock the escalators. <laughs> All right. Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. I'll come back to the escalators okay. later. <laughs> um, on Israel-Palestine, you said the United Nations is working urgently to de-escalate the situation between the Israelis and Palestinians. Um, what specifically is the UN doing? Is the Secretary General making phone calls? Is Mr. Mladenov in contact with Egypt and other Arab yes, uh, uh, Mr. countries Mr. to try and get a ceasefire? Uh, the Secretary General is obviously following it closely. Mr. Mladenov is in the lead. He is currently in Cairo, in fact, today uh, to address the situation. Yes, sir. Earl. Thank you, Mr. Dujeric. Uh, I wanted to ask you... I don't know whether you address it, but I will ask you from the other angle, probably, uh, because you are not commenting on the bilateral issue. Uh, uh, Gambia has decided to uh, sue Myanmar for genocide against uh, Rohingya uh, people. Uh, I know the Secretary General probably would not comment directly on that, but that's the legal framework beside the human rights framework that it is actually dear to him. What does he think? What would be the way uh, to stop the suffering of those people? And is that acceptable? No, we're, we're, as, as you rightly say, we're, we're not going to comment on uh, actions that may be in front of, uh, of the court uh, in The Hague. That's a separate uh, process. For his part, I think the Secretary General has been very direct and very clear, notably in the comments he made in ASEAN, uh, in Bangkok not too long ago, uh, where he laid out a number of measures uh, that he thinks should be uh, taken, re, uh, reiterating the fact that the return of the Rohingya refugees who have been uh, hosted mainly in Bangladesh can only be done in a safe and voluntary uh, basis and safety and, and in dignity, and the fact that they should enjoy, that uh, they, they need to be assured that they enjoy all full rights of any citizens uh, while in, uh, in full rights of any citizens in Myanmar. And he, he did that, in fact, in, in front uh, at a meeting with uh, the state council of, of Myanmar, Dan Aung San Suu Kyi. Okay. For many times he repeated that he is not somehow satisfied with the moves by the government. Uh -huh. It needs to be done more. What is what's the recent most recent action by him or call or talk with the authorities of Myanmar where he has expressed his concern? As, as I said again, he we were in uh, in Bangkok. I, I lose track of the days, but last week I believe, right? Uh, part of the UN ASEAN summit at a table of ASEAN heads of states, small table. Uh, the Secretary General spoke directly in an open meeting to Aung San uh, Suu Kyi. So he delivered uh, that message. That message was made public. Uh, and that was as of, uh, you know, less than a week ago. Uh, and he continues, uh, he will continue to press those messages, both in private and in public. 
Let's go to the back, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Stefan. I have actually two questions, and I, they may be unrelated. The first is there is a policy, which I think is an excellent one, whereby uh, Malu um, keeps press briefings exclusively for press, and diplomats and government representatives are not permitted to uh, enter. And uh, it seems to me to be very important because this protects journalists. Uh, I am interested, though, in knowing what is the reason for this, because I was at a press briefing across the street uh, in which there were government people present, and then they subsequently harassed the actual presenters, the speakers. So it was not really a press conference. Um, and my feeling was that the journalists there, myself included, were to some degree endangered by that. What is the reason why... Uh, diplomats are excluded from press briefings here. Um, if you could be as... Because um, it's a press briefing. <laughs> it's for the press. Uh, as you have today, we sometimes, I sometimes have guests. We have a group of, uh, of young women from a school in Connecticut here. I'd like to have them uh, observe. But uh, ever s this policy has been in place since even before I got here. Uh, and I... <laughs> Even, Even I got here. I don't know if I, before you got here, Errol. Uh, but if I recall, uh, there used to be two, uh, I think François Giuliani, who worked for, um, uh, for Boutros Ghali, used to do two briefings, one for journalists and one for diplomats. Uh, anybody who's interested in looking at uh, watching the briefing can watch it on the, on, on the webcast. And that's yeah. been the policies, and I see no reason why that will change to be the policies. I can't speak for what happens outside of this building. Yeah. What is your second question? The second question is, um, and this is very serious, as you know, the General Assembly adopted a resolution prohibiting the glorification of Nazism. And it has just come to my attention that the brilliant statesman who founded the organization in Lithuania, called Lithuania Without Nazism, has been put into prison. Now, he is also a journalist. Does the secretary, his name is Algirdas Paleskas, and I personally brought him to Washington to speak to the State Department regarding... Uh, I, I, will, uh, uh, call, I will look into this case. I'm, I was not aware of it, but I will look into it. Uh, James. You've been asked about the specific situation regarding Israel and Gaza at the uh, moment, and you've answered on that. But is the Secretary General frustrated about the state of diplomacy on this, given the repeated clashes that break out every now and then? And is it time for high-level diplomacy, possibly led by the Security Council, and for the international community to give up waiting for a peace plan that has been promised now for the best part of three years and may not even exist? Look, I, I think frustra frustrating is, is a word that uh, he probably would use. Uh, and I think if you look at the briefings that Mr. Mladenov has given over the last year uh, to the Security Council, I think frustra you know, f coming out of those briefings, I do get a sense of, of frustration from the diplomats on the, on the UN end. Uh, for us, uh, there needs to be uh, direct dialogue between uh, between the Palestinians and the and the Israelis. I think we've laid out we've laid out our our position repeatedly uh, to the Security Council. Um, what the Security Council decides to do that is really uh, up to them. Uh, but I think there is there is a level of frustration. Betul, and then Edie, and then Linda. Thank you, staff. Two questions. Uh, Turkey has started to deport some of the ISIS fighters it has captured, and one of them is now stranded on the Turkish-Greek uh, border. I was wondering what you have to say on that. And also, the former U.S. UN envoy to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, yesterday said that the faith of the UN depends on its willingness to change with the times. What do you have to say on that as well? I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't read uh, Ambassador Haley's, uh, Haley's book yet. Um, I think the Secretary General uh, has been saying for quite some time that the UN needs to adapt. 
uh, to the 21st uh, century. And if uh, I think you, you, the, the, vis the briefing you had by Fabrizio Hochschild here a few weeks ago about the UN 75 is all about that. What is going to be the UN in 100 years? What is the future of multilateralism? These are questions that the Secretary General has asked. These are discussions that he's having with, with member states. And these are discussions that we want to have with civil society and with the world, uh, with the world at large. But the UN is not just the Secretary General. The UN is also, and very much so, it's 193 member states. Uh, so on your first question, uh, let, let me get some uh, specific language on, the, on that case. Uh, you know, in a, in a recent interview Secretary General gave to French Radio uh, two days ago in Paris, I think he, he said that this was obviously the, the return of foreign, foreign terrorist fighters, something that is that needs to be handled uh, within the framework, obviously, of international law, uh, but that uh, he's, he encouraged countries, European countries, to at least move forward on taking back the children uh, and some of the women uh, who have been involved with foreign terrorist fighters. Can I have a follow-up on that? Yeah. Uh, does the UN have access to the ISIS uh, members in the camps uh, in Syria, as well as their spouses or children? And can you give us a number of how many? Uh, Let me check on the numbers, uh, and I'm not sure we have. Uh, I'm not sure we have access. That may be more something for the uh, International Committee for the Red Cross. Edie, and then Linda. Um, Steph, I have two questions. First, um, Oman is um, reportedly mediating um, indirect talks between Saudi Arabia and Yemen's Houthi mm -hmm. rebels to end the war in Yemen. Um, I wonder whether the Secretary General has any comment on this or whether the UN has any role in this. Uh, I have no comment on this particular issue at this time. My, my second question goes back to yes, please, my favorite please. topic of escalators. escalators. <laughs> I, I raised the issue last week of how much money was being saved yeah. by uh, keeping the escalators between the second and third and third and fourth floors yeah. closed. And uh, I am still waiting for an answer. I think I had given you uh, 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 numbers uh, of how much was saved, but I'm happy to... I mean, we, we know that the yearly cost of running the escalators 14, was fourteen thousand. Yes, yes, we were told. Excuse me, yeah, yeah. follow up. But this is. But I'm talking about two escalators here when others are running both right. uh, for the delegates okay. and otherwise. I I hear your question. And I, uh, I, I also, you know, my, my calves have gone better from walking two floors to go up to the cafeteria every day. But I would like to see the esc. I indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. I will not. I, Marie, I hear you. Um, <laughs> um, there, there have there, there have been reports among some members of the press corps that um, if the price was right, we might be willing to. Uh, start a collection. Okay. Well, let, let me see and uh, how uh, how we can uh, divert some funds into this. Excuse me, Stefan, a follow yes, up on the escalator uh, issue. <laughs> You're going to give these poor students such an amazing vision of the well, UN. Yes, go ahead. Uh, you said it's 14, the, the number that was mentioned, yeah, yeah, 14,000. That's for the fourth floor, since there is half, 50% of it now. So it's a seven thousand on the, uh, I, you know, PRs again, and, I, and other people I, who benefit. I'm well. Uh, I'm pretty well versed in the safety of escalators, but not completely well versed in the actual cost per escalator. Anyway, under no but circumstances that the uh, initial cost of starting the electricity into the escalator is the bulk of the cost. Okay. The other is is yeah. uh, uh, not not as yeah. much. But I'm just saying for okay. the sake no, of I, argument, I, I, it's 50 percent. Always happy to hear things. The, the other thing, argument. coming January 1st, the new fiscal year, do mm -hmm. we anticipate or expect that the escalators will be I would be hope back? so. I would hope so. I will talk to the control. I will, I will speak to, to the controller today. Or this is punitive against the journalist permanently. It is not something against the journalists. I don't know how many times I can well, tell you. Well, the journalists are the one on the third and fourth no. floor, mostly. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, Malu's staff is on the second floor. 
My staff is on the second floor. The uh, the the the, floor. Malu, the, 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 uh, the yes, I know. But we al we also like to access the fourth floor uh, cafeteria. There's also a large DPI or DGC presence on the fourth floor. But I, I, let's so just let's let's move on manually. Let's move on manually. Money yes. Coming in okay. That this issue would be resolved or not? Linda, please. <laughs> I don't think you, you know, I don't think you're necessarily going to. Uh, like this one is, I'm not reprieving you. Put it that okay, way. I'm not, right. You're not off the hook. Okay. So my question is that you say that, I mean, it seems like about two-thirds of the membership still hasn't paid its dues this year. So we have 45 days, a countdown. No, no, less. We have, a, we have 100, uh, have somebody needs to do the math. We have 193 member states right, and, 135, and 134 have paid. So uh, like obviously, some of the, the late, like some, has, some of the late uh, payers are the uh, are owe oh, quite a lot of uh, of money, uh, but you know the, as I as I've said repeatedly, uh, this is not a United States issue. As they have always been paying on a diff on a on a decided, slightly delayed uh, calendar, uh, and we're engaging in discussions uh, with them in rather positive discussions. But following yes. up on that, so. Approximately two thirds of membership has paid. I has guess. paid, yes, yes. Okay, so a third hasn't. Is that the highest proportion of member states that has not? It's paid? not. Uh, I will check. It's it not. I don't year? think the highest proportion. The problem is that you have two basically two different numbers. You have the number of member states that have paid and the percentage of the budget that it represents. Uh, so you could have a higher number of member states have actually paid, but still a higher number of money that is owed because some of the big payers have not uh, owed. But I'll, let's try to get a bit more granular update for you. Okay. I, 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 li I like this kind of like a group, uh, yeah, group discussions. Yes, Masood, and then we'll go. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So why don't um, I'm going to ask you a question, which I usually do about the continued incarceration of 8 million Kashmiri Muslims. And also now added to that is this atmosphere of ethnic cleansing, which is now obtaining in India, which has been, which if you know, was reported by the New York Times day before yesterday. So in that case, is the Secretary General at any point in time going to intervene and talk to the Indian Prime Minister? Yes, I've said, uh, you, you have asked this question a number of times, and I've given you the same answer, that the Secretary General has engaged directly with the Prime Minister of India on a number of times, has engaged directly with the Prime Minister of Pakistan a number of times. Uh, the fact that the situation remains unchanged on the ground is a fact, uh, which does not uh, obscure our continued concern for the situation in Kashmir. Uh, yeah. uh, one has taken steps to ease the tension between the countries by allowing the Sikhs to go. Yes, and, and we and uh, we we welcome that. Uh, we welcome that. Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday, I stumbled across a video on Web TV, and it's of Ghislaine Maxwell, who is the Jeffrey Epstein alleged co-conspirator for lots of child sex trafficking, and she's giving a press conference right there. Uh, it's still on the UN's website. Do you guys have like a policy for removing videos of people who are credibly accused of sex trafficking? Uh, I think she was here a few years or years. Yeah, ago. it was 2013. Yes, exactly. We do not have a policy of removing uh, videos from events that have taken place. Thank you all. Hasta mañana. <laughs>